All right, so here in Psalm chapter 50, you know, it's real interesting because we live in a society, you know, we're constantly trying to combat the world and the worldly influence. We also need to combat the, the false Christianity that's out there. And, and you know, we, we live in a nation where still, by and large, most people identify with themselves as Christian. And the numbers seem to be declining, and obviously the morality is declining. But we still have a large populace of people that will claim to be Christian, and they have this concept of God and, and this idea that gets promoted and propagated, and it's an imbalanced view. And if you wonder why, you know, I kind of hit on this frequently in the preaching, and, it's, and I'm try, I try not to get a lopsided view either. Right, because God isn't just all hate and, and just angry and just mad all the time. It's not true. But we need to be able to preach on this to, to kind of counterbalance because there's a lot of people that just say, God's love, God's never angry, God doesn't hate anybody, God loves everybody. And you know what? It sounds nice. And that's why so many people like to hear it. But it's not the truth. You know, the Bible, it's true that God loved the world. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But my friends, I'll tell you this, people who are burning and under our feet right now in hell, God doesn't love those people anymore. If He loved them, He would not be torturing and tormenting them in hell. He just wouldn't do it. Which is why, as a child of God, when you get saved, you don't have to worry about that punishment because you are God's child and He's always going to love you forever. He's going to love you forever. And, that's, and that is a, a, a promise that He makes to us. Now, everyone that was in hell, God loved them at one point. And that's why I said, for God so loved, past tense, the world. God wants everyone to be saved. It is His desire. But there are people that, you know, when you die without Christ, for example, God doesn't love you anymore. He's given you opportunities and, you know, you've, you've turned your neck. You, you haven't softened your heart. You haven't humbled yourself and accepted Christ as your Savior. So what I find interesting here in Psalm chapter 50 is we see that God is coming back. Now, you remember when Jesus Christ came the first time, he said, I came not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And you could think of the instances where, you know, they brought the woman taken in adultery and they brought her to Jesus. And, you know, this they did tempting him because they were trying to trip him up in his words. They're trying to get Jesus in trouble. And basically, you know, people always throw that out. And it's going to be it's, this point is actually going to be important with this sermon today because I'm preaching about the God of justice. Okay, God is a judge, and He knows what justice is. And I'll get a little bit ahead of myself. It's fine. Just so you know what the, what the, the content of the sermon is, what the meat is that, that we're going to be preaching about this morning, what we'll be learning about, is that God is a just judge. And we're going to be looking at some Old Testament scriptures. We're going to be looking at some appropriate punishments for, for crime and how God decided things to be. And one of the arguments that people will say is that, oh, well, in the New Testament, you know, when they brought the adulterer, you know, the woman taking adultery to Jesus, you know, he didn't kill her. But that's because that wasn't his job. Like, at the, the time when Jesus Christ came, he didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't come to rule and reign as he will in the future. He came that the world could be saved. He came to offer himself up as a sacrifice. He came to pay for the sins of the whole world. That's what he came to do. He came to, to seek and to save that which is lost. He did not come. He came in the role of a servant to minister unto other people, to help other people, not to be the judge. But he's coming back. In judgment, He's coming back to judge and He will sit on a throne and He will rule and reign over this earth. And then, my friends, when a woman is taken in adultery, He will be the judge at that point because He already fulfilled the role as the Savior. He's already done that. And I'm not saying that there's no forgiveness because absolutely there is forgiveness. But with the, with the woman taken in adultery, when He said, you know, let he that is without sin among you cast the first stone... 
there's a lot of teaching there. I'm not going to get real in-depth on that. But notice he didn't say, don't stone her. Now, that's what happened. And in a way, that's kind of... It, he was showing their hypocrisy through his wise words that he spake. Because the whole reason they even brought her to him was because they were trying to condemn Jesus. That's why they brought her to Jesus. Because they have their own courts. They have their own high priests. They have their own ways of dealing with that. So why did they bring him to Jesus? Jesus wasn't you know, the high priest of the Jews. Now, he was spiritually, right? We know that, of course, Jesus Christ is you know, was Melchizedek, he's the high priest, he is a new, he, he brings forth a new priesthood, right? We know that, but that's not the way that he was, he wasn't a Pharisee, right? He wasn't living under, under that as the, you know, as Caiaphas or Annas, the high priests at that time, who would be dealing with those matters of judgment. They brought him to Jesus because they tried to accuse him, basically, and he just turned it around on them. And that's the whole point of that. But never in scripture do we see uh, other than a few of the, the fulfillments of God's law, we don't see repeals of God's standard and God's ideas of justice and judgment. So what we see here, look, and look down at Psalm 50, because here's a view of God that we need to make sure that we understand. It says in verse 3, Our God shall come. And shall not keep silence. Look at this. A fire shall devour before him. And it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. There's a fire coming before God. That's not this teddy bear, you know, oh, God's coming. A fire and a great storm. This tempestuous is going to be you know, forceful, powerful when God comes back. And you're going to see that and, and everybody's going to be fear, fearful because it is a mighty and powerful God that you will see coming down. He comes with fire and he comes to judge the earth, to judge his people. Look at verse number five. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So he was coming to judge his people. And, you know, unbelievers obviously have a lot to worry about with God, the judge, because we know what the sentence is for unbelievers, for, for all the sins that they've committed. It's the same sentence that we would have, but as a believer, we, you know, the, the punishment of hell has been paid for, it's been fulfilled, it's been taken away through the blood of Jesus Christ. But as believers, we need to worry about the justice and judgment of God in this lifetime. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we need to make sure that as children of God, that we're doing the right thing, that we're listening to him, so we don't need the, the chastening and the chastisement of our God because he will come and judge his people. And when God's people don't hold the line, when we don't stand firm and are steadfast in our faith and just get real permissive with sin and, and, and you know, cause a, a bad name to be brought upon Jesus Christ through our own sins, God's going to judge that. Now, we're not going to be thrown in the lake of fire, but he's going to judge that of us. And he's going to come, and we need to have a healthy fear of God. But here we see in verse 6, it says, of course, God is judge himself. God is the judge, right? I'm not the judge, you're not the judge, but... Just because I'm not the judge doesn't mean I can't say what God's word says the judge is going to do. Right? People all say, oh, you're judging. Oh, you can't judge me. Oh, you're... Look, I'm not the judge, but I'll tell you, this is how God will judge. It's how I know who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell because we have God's word written here. Now, I'm not going to be one casting you into hell, but the Bible says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, and he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You are condemned if you don't believe in Jesus Christ. And that's not me casting my own personal judgment on you. That's God's word. And guess what? The judge will condemn you. I didn't give you the condemnation. You got that all on your own from God. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And see, people will, will look at that and say, oh, you're judging me. And you know, No, 
Actually, I'm not really judging you in that context because God's the one that judges. I'm here to warn you and tell you, and, and you know what? It's going to be the same way. Again, that's a, a salvation example. But we need to be warned about all kinds of sin and everything else in our life. Now, look at what he says. There's, there's two groups of people here that he's dealing with in Psalm chapter 50. He deals with the righteous, and he, then he deals with the, with the wicked. And unto the righteous, he's explaining, he's saying, look, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Right? Because in the Old Testament, they're offering up these sacrifices and everything. It's like, do you think I really need these? Do you think I need the blood of bulls and goats? Do you think I need to eat? He, said, he says, if I were hungry, do you think I'd even tell you about it? Like, oh, human, you know, like, oh, here, God, here, here's, a, here's a bull. I'll give this to you. Like, he's like, I don't need that. He's like, I know what all the birds are doing in the whole world. I own a cattle on a thousand hills. I made all of this stuff. I don't need it. And people get too caught up. The, the saints back then could get too caught up in the, in, the, in the rituals and not understanding what they were for. Now, of course, it was important and God's law is important. They, they needed to be providing all the proper sacrifices. I'm not saying they didn't, but see what God was more focused on. It's not the, the, um, the following through the robotic actions of taking a sacrifice and doing it. He was interested in their hearts. And that's why he says here in verse number 14, Offer unto God thanksgiving. So give God thanks. Give God credit for all the good in your life. And pay thy vows unto the Most High. He's going to hold you to that. When you make a promise unto God and you say, God, you know, I'll do this and this. Keep those vows. Keep your word unto God. He expects you to do that. When you open up your mouth unto the Lord, keep your vows and call upon me. Look, this is what he wants. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. Faith. That's what he, he keeps stressing. Faith. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. He wants us to rely on him. He wants us to be able to look on him and just go to him with all of our needs and all of our cares and all of our troubles not to be uh, and, and we have so many examples of that throughout the Old Testament where the children of Israel would lose faith and they'd go to Egypt and they'd go to these other cities and they'd try to get them to, to help them out in the wars every time every time without fail that they relied on God and God alone and they prayed unto God and they would fast and say God there's this huge host that's come out against us this huge multitude of people there's no way we can win this God and they'd call on God God would deliver them every single time Every time. Show me an example where God did not deliver his people when they solely trusted in him. Every single time. And it doesn't matter how far the odds were stacked against them. That's what he keeps trying to explain over and over and over and over again. And we need to have that same type of faith in our life. Every time something bad comes up and it's overwhelming and you don't know how to handle it and you don't know what to do about the situation, God wants you to rely on him and trust in him and, and he will deliver you. Without fail. It's a promise here. These are the words of the Lord. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. God gets all the praise. God gets all the credit when, when he sends a great deliverance like that. But that's what he wants from his people. He wants faith. But then he turns to the wicked. Look at verse number 16. But unto the wicked God saith. So now he's got a different message for them. To the righteous, to the saved, he's saying, look, just rely on me. Okay, I, I know you guys are doing all these sacrifices and all this other stuff. I don't really need that. What I need is your faith. What I need is you to trust in me. That's what I care about. But then he turns to the wicked. He's got a message for them. Verse 16, But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Interesting. He's talking to people that are declaring God's laws. His statutes. What hast thou to do to declare, to speak of my laws? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. He said, what are you doing quoting my laws? And he's saying, that's unto the wicked. Why would he say that? Matthew 7 gives a good... Keep, stay here in Psalm 50. I'll just read for you. Matthew 7, a real famous passage. Verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven. So again, we see people professing the Lord, professing God. And Lord, Lord, not, not any other God. I mean, they're professing the God of the Bible, Jehovah. Just as the wicked did here in Psalm chapter 50. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. They're confronted with God, saying, God, you know, look, we've done all this work for you. We prophesied, we preached, we cast out devils, we did all of these works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So he's basically calling them wicked also. Them that work iniquity. Why? Because they're trusting in their own works. They're trusting in the law. They're trusting in themselves for their salvation. And that's why what he's doing here in Psalm chapter 50, he's turning to the wicked. He's saying, look, you're declaring my statutes. You're declaring my laws. And how many so-called Christians are they? Hey, they have got the right God, Jesus Christ, right? They've got the right one. But what are they trusting in? The law? They're trusting in, well, I'm a pretty good person. Well, I haven't killed anybody. Well, and, and they start saying the laws of God. And God's saying, who are you? What, what do you think you're doing declaring my statutes? Because they're not even saved. It says in verse in 17, Seeing thou hatest instruction and casteth my words behind me. Why do they hate instruction? Because they haven't received their salvation as a free gift. They, 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 you, know, you could be told how to do it. They hate instruction. They cast God's word behind them. I don't want to hear that, but they'll still just repeat his laws. Verse 18. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with, consentest with, them, with him and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. So he's saying, you know, when you saw the thief, you joined him. You were, you were consenting to him being a thief. You're being a partaker of adulterers. You know, all these things, you're breaking his laws. And, he's, and they're the ones that are spouting off his laws, right? They're like the Pharisees that will say, but they don't do, right? They're hypocrites. They'll, they'll, they'll tout God's law all day, but then they go and do the same things that they speak against. And he says, God's saying, you know what? I kept silence. I didn't say anything. I just let you keep on going off and, and doing what you're doing. To the point to where it says, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. He's like, you started thinking that I'm just like you. That this is actually all just okay. That what you're doing is just fine. And see, the wicked have a tendency to get comfortable. Because they don't get the judgment immediately. It doesn't always come right away. So they start thinking, wow, I'm getting away with this. Wow, I'm... I'm preaching God's word and I'm doing all this stuff and I'm getting away. God didn't do anything to me. It must be just fine. And my friend, that is the wrong attitude to take with sin. Just because something doesn't happen to you immediately, don't think that God's just okay with it. And don't get emboldened to continue in your sin. He says, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Saying, I've been silent. I haven't said anything. But don't worry. The reproof is coming. The rebuke is going to come. Has anyone in here ever talked to an atheist about morality? About what's right and what's wrong? Have you ever thought about that? Because I've, I've been in conversations like this before and it's really kind of fun. Because what it boils down to is they, they have to fumble around on how to determine what's right and what's wrong. You think about where does our morality come from? It comes from God. How do we know what's right and wrong? How could we as human beings know? Now God has given us a conscience. He's given us some wisdom and some understanding to, to know these things. But at the end of the day, how do you prove well, what's right and what's wrong? How can you determine that? Now, when you're, talking to, you know, when you're talking to a Christian, you could say, well, God has told us. And it's as simple as that. The Creator, the, man, the, the God that made us, says, this is right and this is wrong. Very simple. Now, of course, it all makes sense, God's laws. 
they are perfect. They, they do make sense not to be doing evil to other people and everything else. But God is the one that has that authority to say this is right and this is wrong. But think about it. If there were no God, if God didn't exist, and we really are just animals that have evolved, and we are just further along the chain than the monkey, we're further along than the fish, than the amphibian, than, you know, we've, we've made it up to this point. But we're ultimately still animals. Because we've just changed, we, we've just been lucky enough that, that our DNA has changed and we've had mutations and you know, whatever, all the whole nonsense of, of their thinking and belief system and their religion. But if that were truly the case, you can tell me all day long why this is moral and this is immoral, why this is right and this is wrong. All it is is your opinion. And what makes your opinion any better than mine? if we're all just animals and if there is no God. And what if I say, well, there is no God. I'm the God of my world. And you know what? My morality is whatever is best for me, that's what's right. Whatever I want to do. Hey, if I feel like it and I want to take someone else's life, what do I care about them? I'm my own God. And if I'm just you know, another animal. Anyways, I mean, we look at the animal kingdom. Animals kill animals all day long. And it's not even always just for food. So what makes, what would make my belief in that scenario immoral? You can, you can give me all the reasons all you want, but why is your reason better than my reason? Because we'd all be equal. We'd all be on the same, you could say, oh yeah, but you're hurting someone else. Okay, so what? What makes it wrong? The only thing that they can say to make it wrong is that, well, we could get a bunch of people to, to force you to, do, you know, to act a certain way. Okay, but it doesn't still provide morality. That's just force. That's not morality. The only morality we can get and, and trust and believe in is, is from God. Otherwise, there is nothing. And you know what? That's why the atheists and the, and the, the people who don't believe in a God, they're fools. The Bible says the fool said in his heart there is no God. But it also allows them to, to not care about their own sin. Because there is no judge. There is no God. They're their own judge. And every man's righteous in his own eyes. That's why we need to view ourselves through God's eyes. Because he's the judge. We need to be able to look at ourselves and look at our lives and stack that against how does God view me? All of us here, when you look at your own life, if you were just to look at yourself, everybody's got a positive view of themselves. We talk to people about soul winning all the time, and everybody's like, I'm a pretty good person. I do good things. And that's, you know, most of them think that's why they're going to heaven. But it's very, 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 very rare that you run into someone that'll say, you know what, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a good guy at all. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a bad person, and they have a low view of themselves. Most people think very highly of themselves, and they'll say, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect. Right, everyone will admit that, but they all think they're pretty good. And see, the problem is we have a tendency not to view ourselves through God's eyes and through his morality. See, God's the judge. He's the one that determines what is right and what is wrong. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 18. Just go forward in your Bible, past Psalms, past Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18. I'll read for you from Deuteronomy 16, verse 20. The Bible reads, That which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So God wants us to do that which is just. And the reason why I went over all that stuff is because, well, how do we know what's just? What's just is what's right. It's what's right versus what's wrong. It's morality, right? How do we know what to do with just? Well, because we have God's word. Because we have the Bible. And he says, if do that which is altogether just, he says, that's what you need to follow, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. saying, you know, I'll bless you. Things will work out for you. But do what I tell you to do. Do what's right. Do what's just. So what does it mean to do, to be just according to the Bible? Look at Ezekiel 18, verse number 5. 
Ezekiel 18, verse number 5 reads, But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right. So in order to be just, you're doing what is lawful and right. Lawful is according to the law. Does that just mean according to the law of the land? No, according to God's law. Verse 6, and if not, and this is how we, we know that. He says, do that which is lawful and right. And then he lists off a bunch of God's laws. And hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly, he is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. So that is what the Bible's definition of justice is. It's keeping God's laws, walking in his statutes. And he lists off some of the Ten Commandments and some other statutes. And he says, look, keep my judgments, keep my statutes. That's how you're just. Now, I'm not gonna, we don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Proverbs, Proverbs 17. I explained this a few weeks ago, but Romans 13 explains that there's powers that are ordained by God. And it kind of talks about our human government and how God has established the powers that be. And the powers is to punish evildoers. That is the purpose that God has given. That is the authority that God has given to human government is to be able to punish people who do evil. And it, it, I mean, just real briefly, think about it. It makes sense because normally I don't have the power to inflict harm against any other individual, right? And, and let's just go straight to the death penalty. I cannot take, God has forbidden me to take uh, someone else's life. And he's, he's given that to everyone else. You know, we're not supposed to commit murder. So let me rephrase it. We're not to commit murder. But he has ordained a power whereby making it just and right for the death penalty to exist. And the way that that happens is through the human government to where there's judges, to where facts are presented, to where people essentially have due process. We, we, we use that word today, obviously it's not found in the Bible, but basically there's evidence that's brought forth, there's witnesses, and there is a, a high level of certainty that needs to be there in order to convict somebody. You know, you have to have two people that are willing to say that, yes, I saw this person, yes, I did this crime, you know, before you could even uh, allow for a conviction to be in place for someone to lose their life. But there are many crimes, as we'll see, and we'll go over that um, here in a few minutes, many crimes that the Bible lists off as having the death penalty as the result, as the, as the judgment, as being a just judgment for that crime. And God instituted human government in order to take care of that, in order to execute the judgment, in order to punish the evildoers. It's the same way that it's, it's, it's basically an establishment in order for justice to be carried out. And whether it's a death penalty or anything else, right? If somebody steals, then they need to, to pay back fourfold or fivefold or sevenfold or what, you know, whatever the just judgment is in all the different cases for all the different crimes against other people. Now, what Romans 13 is not about, which is, which is a false view that a lot of people have, is just that the government just has all this extra authority over your life. A good example is I just, I just saw a video the other day of there was this guy that was jogging and he's an open carry activist. So there's some people that like to carry their firearm in open, in public, because what that does is a lot of people these days are freaked out at the sight of a gun. They don't know what to do. They're just like, oh man, a gun, what's that? And I'll be honest with you, when I moved from Illinois, you know, from the, from the People's Republic of, of Chicago into a, a much more free area in Arizona here, and I went to the grocery store and I saw a gun on, on a guy's hip, it's like, whoa, 
Why? Because I've been conditioned into not seeing that ever except on a police officer or on a gangbanger. That's been my conditioning to ever see a gun. And the gangbangers don't keep them out in public. I mean, they, they, they conceal it. So the point of why people will go out and do this is to try to get people used to the idea that, hey, it's okay. There are plenty of good people out there that are carrying guns. Just because you have a gun doesn't automatically make you a criminal. And it's try to, 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 to reverse some of the, the programming that's been done and the brainwashing of people just thinking, oh, gun equals bad. Oh, gun equals criminal. So people will do this type of thing. And this guy was out there and he's just jogging, right? And I don't know where he had his firearm. Somehow I was out in the open and he gets stopped by the police. And, you know, he was, he was being nice and friendly and everything. And they have this conversation and the guy's like, he, doesn't need, he, knows, he knows the law and he knows what he's allowed to do. And um, he didn't commit any crimes. You know, they stopped him and he was just like, he didn't want to, to give out any information and, and everything else. And he was being polite. But anyways, I don't want to get into the whole story. What happened was the cops asked him, hey, well, you know, are you, I don't know, I don't know exactly what he said. Are you a God-fearing man or do you go to church or something like that? And he's like, yeah, you know, like I'm a Christian. And um, he says, well, you know, the, the Bible says you got to obey the authorities. And I'm the authority. And that's what he's like trying to explain that of why he needs to just comply with everything that the cop is telling him to do. Now, in the false perversions of the Bible, it will say that you have to submit to the authorities, like to, like, to the government, to the authority figures. But you see, God hasn't given the government the power to just harass you and stop you and take away your rights. And, and take away your right to protect yourself or to defend yourself. He hasn't given the government that right or the authority to do that. It's just like, I mean, think about it. That, that same mentality saying, well, I'm a cop, so you just have to obey me no matter what. How did that work out in Germany for Christians under the regime of, of Adolf Hitler? Or how about in Russia under Joseph Stalin? How does that work? Is it, are you saying then it's still just because you have a brown shirt coming to your door and saying, okay, you're coming with me. Well, you just have to submit to their authority because God has given them that authority. No. When they come to execute you, God has not given them that authority. They don't, it's not just, you, if you're not an evildoer and not receiving a just recompense, then they don't have that authority. It's not given to them by God. They have usurped that authority. So we need to be very careful with our understanding of Romans 13 because it's not that difficult to understand. It's just giving us why God has instituted that power to begin with so that we could, he could punish the evildoers. Now, if God established this power to punish evildoers, do you think he just left it up to us to determine who is evil, who is an evildoer arbitrarily? Just come up with it on your own. No, of course not. I mean, think about this. What, what I mean by that is, where do you draw the line? How do we make up our human government laws? Right? Because people always say, oh, keep religion out of government and everything else. Now, I'm not saying that you have, we have to have a religious government, but how do you determine what even should be a law? What's against the law? How do we determine that? What do we go to? Where is our go-to guide? What do we determine morality from? Well, we have to get it from God and from the Bible. Otherwise, you're just, like I said before, you're just kind of making up your own stuff. And the way things used to be in this country, people understood that. People got their source, by and large, got their source of truth and morality from the Bible. This is what they would turn to, and the laws of the land reflected that. Now, I've, I've, I think it's been a couple years now, so I put up this video clip a long time ago about... Um, when Pastor Anderson was receiving a bunch of flack from people for, for saying that homosexuals should be put to death, that it should be against the law, punishable by the death penalty, and I was defending him and defending what he said, and I said something about the laws of the land you know, being different, and people, it's funny, and be careful what you read and what you believe. People will say all kinds of things. And they'll say things boldly and they'll say things like, like they're an authority. And I, I've studied this and you are just completely flat out wrong. No, I'm not. 
The laws of the land in this country used to have the death penalty for homosexuality. Are you listening? The death penalty for homosexuality used to be a punishment in this country. In the United States of America, yes, even after 1787 when the Constitution was signed and put into place. Yes, and definitely before then. In the colonies, in the settlements, God's laws were much more closely the law of the land. Did you know that even in, hey, who's heard of common law? English common law. Have you heard about common law? Yeah. Sodomy used to be punishable by the death penalty in the common law also. Now that was changed in the 1800s. But even in the United States up until the mid-1800s, the last state to change the sentencing of sodomy, not to make it legal, but just to change it from the death penalty to like a prison sentence, five years or whatever it was, the maximum penalty allowed was in the mid-1800s by like South Carolina. It was like the last state to remove death penalty as the maximum penalty for sodomy. It used to be the law in the land. And it used to be prevalent where when people, back in the old days, when people would actually care and get their morality from God. Actually, turn if you would to Leviticus 20. I know I had you turn to Proverbs, but I just I want to get to Leviticus 20 because we need to be getting our sense of what's right and what's just and what's, you know, how we ought to be governing ourselves from the Bible. Not from the atheist. Proverbs 17, 15 says, He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. What we have today is a lot of people that want to justify the wicked. They want to say, oh, it's just fine. Oh, that's not a crime. Oh, everything's okay with that. We're okay with adultery these days. We're okay with homosexuality these days. We're okay with all these different crimes. Not just sins, crimes. Crimes are punishable by a sentence. Notice, and notice this too, when you read your Bible, not all sin is a crime that it comes with a punishment. When our laws are, when, when God told the children of Israel what their laws were going to be, He did not list off every single sin that every single sin was to be against the law because, I mean, then everyone would just be a criminal all the time. He, he made, like, for example, a good example of that is, you know, drinking alcohol or getting drunk. Now, that is something that has been against the law in this country, but that is not something that God has ever put as a law of saying, well, if somebody gets drunk, then they owe this fine or they deserve this many beatings or, lash, you know, whatever. Like, what, th that doesn't exist in the Bible. Now, I believe that we should follow God's plan. If he says something is a crime, if he says something is punishable by whatever the punishment is, then that's the way, then that's justice. That is just and that is right. And if he didn't say it, then why do we need it? Why do I need an ordinance that could fine me or throw me in jail if my grass is too high? Right? For example, we have stupid laws like that in this country or, or whatever. You know, I'm not committing a crime. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not, and, and ultimately, it's not found in the Bible. Yet man has this tendency to want to control people and they come up with all their own laws for all their own reasons out of their wicked heart. But the Bible says that when you justify the wicked, when you say that, that they're just, that it's okay, that it's not a crime, when we get rid of our laws against sodomy, when we get rid of our laws against other things that the Bible says ought to have a punishment associated with it, that's an abomination. And he that condemneth the just. So the just, the one that believes God's law, they get condemned all day long by the world saying, oh, you know, how dare you? Oh, that's hate speech. Oh, you, you know, you're the one that should be put to death and all this other stuff. That's an abomination also. Malachi 2.17 says, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? And God's wearied today. Why do I say that? Because it's, the verse continues, When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? People there are calling evildoers good. There's nothing wrong with it. 
accept it. It started with tolerate, then it's accept, now it's promote. That is where we're at. And, and that, is, that is the plan, that is the agenda of the wicked, of the evildoers that want you to, to not only tolerate, but to accept and endorse their sin and their wickedness. And that's an abomination in God's eyes. Let's look at Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20 has a lot of the, the capital crimes listed off. It's, it's the most complete chapter about this. I'm not going to say it has absolutely everything in it because there are other crimes that you'll find in other areas. But by and large, we're going to see here offenses that God deems worthy of death. Now, <clears throat> let's just read some of this. Let's read in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Okay, what they did was they were literally giving human sacrifices unto false gods. Now, fortunately today, I think we probably could still have a consensus that that is evil and wicked and wrong and should be against the law. And, you know, some people are completely against the death penalty, but you know what the Bible says? Stone them with stones. The people that need to, to kill them dead because that is extremely wicked. That's a no-brainer. He starts off with just this no-brainer. Okay, if you get to the point where you think that just sacrificing children unto false gods is acceptable, your <laughs> judgment of God is right around the corner if you're still around because that is just wicked as hell. Verse number three, And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Verse four, And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go a-whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And he's saying, look, if you don't want to deal with it, if you say if you just hide your eyes from it and just pretend like it's not happening, like so many people do these days, just look the other way, oh, let's just pretend like it's not happening, God's going to be against you. Said, okay, you don't want to deal with this? You're not going to you know, impose the, the appropriate judgment? God's going to be against you. Look at verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. This is your... your uh, Psychic reading, your tarot cards, your wizards. This is why I do not allow my children to have any Harry Potter books or to do the Lord of the Rings stuff or anything that has to do with magic and wizards and, and any of that stuff. The Bible says, look, and we'll get to that later in this chapter, a wizard or a necromancer, they, they need to a witch, they get put to death. That is the death penalty. God says, don't do it. You are going to lose your life if you commit that crime of, of dealing with devils because that's what they're doing. When you're dealing with familiar spirits, a familiar spirit is a devil. And God says, you are not to get involved with that. Don't get involved in that realm. You don't know anything about it. And he says, if you do it, it deserves the death penalty. Let's keep reading here. Verse, let's jump down to verse 9. For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. I'm going to keep reading here. We'll go back to all of these because people have problems with these verses. And we're going we're gonna to just read through them real quick and then I'll go back and cover it. So someone that curses their father or mother shall, uh, shall be put to death. And the man that committeth adultery, verse 10, with another man's wife... Uh, with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife 
hath uncovered his father's nakedness, nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. And it goes on and on. Now look, people will mock you and criticize you. Oh, you believe the Bible. Oh, you think we should have those Levitical laws. Well, what about the, you know, the man that curses his father or mother? Oh, so you think homosexuals should be put to death because the Bible says if a man lie with a mankind as he lies with a woman, he should surely be put to death. Yes, I do. Let me repeat that. Yes, I do. Do you think that your sense of justice and what's right and what's wrong is better than God's? Do you have the pride and the arrogance to say that I can't believe God would say that a man that curses his father or mother should be put to death? Are you going to judge God now? Yet Christians, I get criticism all the time on my sermons that I post about this subject. All the time. People who claim the name of Christ will say, and they'll mock. They'll mock at these, oh, so do you think we should have this? Because what they normally hear is the homosexual one, right? Because that's the, the, the big topic today anyways. And that's what I'm trying to fight hard against is just this trying to make it normal when it's not normal and it's wicked as hell and, and they deserve the death penalty according to God's righteous judgment. But then they'll bring up, oh, well, what about, you know, and they always get it wrong. So I'll say, what about a disobedient child? No, it doesn't say a disobedient child. Every child is disobedient. It says someone that curses their father or their mother. Now, I believe this is talking about adults anyways. But um, when someone curses, that's like saying, you know, they ought to go to hell. That is such a lack of respect. And you know what? God is big on respect, on honoring your father and mother. You know, it's in the Ten Commandments. And um, if he says that that is just, because he doesn't want this entire society of children just thinking that they could do and hate their parents and, and do whatever they please because it'll destroy the nation. If God says that that's the way it should be, then you know what? Even if I don't understand it, I'm going to go with God's way of thinking and his sense of justice over my own sense of justice. And we need to view these sins where God says this deserves a death penalty. And treat it as such and have the proper view of that sin. You know, as I mentioned earlier about the, the tarot cards and the psychic reading stuff, that's something that people today just make fun of and just go and do as a joke. Right? Hey, ha, 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 let's have laughs. Let's go to the psychic reader, you know. And even if you don't really care about it, you don't believe in it, but you're like, let's just do this for fun. Right? People do that all the time. They'll go to the fair. They'll go to Vegas. They'll go wherever. They'll stop by in one of these places. And say, let's, just, let's just go get this, you know, this psychic reading. Let's just go see what happens. And they do it for fun. Do you really think that God is amused? Do you think that God thinks that's very fun when he says, you know what? The wizard and the witch should be burned with fire. I don't think God thinks that that's very amusing. I don't think he thinks that's very fun. We need to have the proper view and just and not be so slack of, of our view of the just judge that's going to be coming in fire saying, oh, God doesn't care. Oh, what's the big deal anyways? The big deal is that God says they, they deserve death. That's the big deal. And if you don't think it's a big deal, then you're wrong. Your sense of what's right, your morality is screwed up. Your sense of justice is is imbalance. It's not right because God has, God, the Lord hath said, thus saith the Lord. And you could read, I'm not going to read the rest of this chapter. It goes on and on. I read the parts that are, that are, for the most part, people have the most problem with. Because what, what do you hear today? Oh, well, whatever two consenting adults do behind closed doors, that's their own business. What, you know, what does it matter to you? Well, the only reason it matters to me at all is because God says that that is a crime and it deserves a death penalty. That's why.
Because he says that is, such, that is so wicked that the only way to solve that problem is just by putting them to death. Sin begets sin. And sin is like a cancer. And when you start getting into this weird perversions of, and the sodomites, you know, they go out and recruit people. They go out and defile young children. They go out and molest people and try to recruit them into their lifestyle. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're almost done. <clears throat> oh, I've also heard this argument too. I'm glad I put that in my notes. I've heard people say that, uh, well, we shouldn't do the death penalty because what happens if that person gets saved later on? You know, if we put them to death now, you know, and they're unsaved, they're just going to go straight to hell. But maybe if they're not put to death, they might get saved in that time frame before they die, right? And it sounds like a right, you know, not, it sounds like a good thing, right? It sounds like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, God's not willing that any should perish. God wants them to be saved, so let's just let them live, and maybe they will get saved. But we, first of all, what you're not thinking about is, well, maybe they won't get saved and maybe they'll continue to do what they've been doing. Maybe they'll continue to murder again. Maybe they'll continue to defile again. Maybe they'll continue to do this stuff and now you are causing innocent people to become victims because you didn't deal with the problem right the first time. But they say, oh, it's all about their salvation. No, look, they have their chance. They do have their chance, but people need to understand that there are consequences for our actions. We, what, what type of society would we have if there was zero consequences, zero laws, and no recompense for anything that you do? No fear of what might happen if you commit a crime. No justice whatsoever. And really, that's what they're contending for. They're saying that and, and you know what? There's no compassion on the victims either. Talk to someone who's been defiled as a child by a sodomite. That haunts them. That ruins their life in many cases. They turn to alcohol and drugs, all those things, because their mind is so screwed up because somebody did that to them. And what they really need is to see, you know what? This is not tolerated. That person's being executed. He was so filthy that he's being put to death. And the victim can reconcile that and say, you know what? Yeah, it wasn't my fault. That guy is wicked and he got put to death and he got what he deserved. Because oftentimes what happens is that the pedophiles are just still accepted and embraced. And, oh, he's got a little bit of a problem. Or they just deny it altogether. And people will just turn their neck. And, and the, ch the young child who's been defiled sees this. And they see nothing being done about it. And then they start to wonder, wow, is this, is this right? Is this okay? Did I do something? Did I bring this to happen? And, and it screws up their head. They need to see the justice carried out. And, you know, honestly, I like the sentencing in the Old Testament where it talks about stoning people with stones. And there's a reason for that. I don't think we should just be doing the gas chamber. I don't think we should be doing these humane ways of putting people to death. The reason why is because we need to have the proper hatred for these types of sins. It's easy to just let everyone else do it, but when the Bible talks about the congregation and the people picking up stones, you know, after the judgment has been passed, after the judge says that, you know, that all the evidence has been presented, if you are physically picking up that stone and throwing it, you need, I mean, you need to be settled and founded. This is wrong. We will not tolerate this. It gives you that proper view of the hatred for the sin when you're involved in carrying out the sentence. Say, so we're not going to stand for this. Some people don't have a problem with that, but other people do. And I think, you know, being a part of that, like the, the way that God has outlined it. Now, and again, don't take me wrong and don't misquote me because I'm not saying we should just all take the law in our own hands right now 
and pick up rocks and throw them at people who have, who have committed crimes. The way that the, 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 the form of punishment is to be meted out under the proper authorities and under the proper judgment that's been given, not a mob, not anything like that, not a vigilantism. When the, when the power that God has ordained has decreed that a person is guilty of a crime that deserves a death penalty, that is how the death penalty is carried out. And I agree with that, with God's way of sentencing and God's way of executing justice. Now, you're in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Read that again. Because sentence, what's the sentence? It's, it's carrying out the punishment, right? Against an evil work. Someone who's done evil. The sentence needs to be, it says, when the sentence is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. When you don't have swift justice, when people are just getting away with something, like now we have people on death row for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. People who commit those types of crimes look at it and say, well, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'll go in jail. I'm not going to lose my life. It's not going to be the end because even if I, if I get the death penalty, I've got all kinds of time. I've got all kinds of time. And the Bible says when you don't execute it speedily, once you, once you determine the guilt, hey, Let's carry out that sentence. It's done. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. When you don't have the proper punishment, it's gonna, this, the, the, the crimes are going to abound. You need to have the proper punishment and they need to be executed speedily. Verse 12, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Turn if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Just one more, one more proof, one more piece of evidence that, you know, as a society, we ought to be enacting God's laws. And God's laws, are, God's the judge. He knows what's right. He knows what's wrong. God doesn't change. He doesn't all of a sudden think like, well, that's not wrong. You know, I, I thought, I used to think that committing adultery was so bad that people ought to be put to death, but I don't think that anymore. Actually, I, I think it's just fine. You think God changes like that? You think God says, you know what? When a man lies with a mankind as he lies with a woman, he should be put to death. But you know what? Now we've, we've learned so much. We've gotten so much wiser and we care about people so much more now that, you know, I don't know what I was thinking back then. I was just kind of angry. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Now, you know what? Now we're not going to punish people that way. That's foolishness. Of course God feels the same way about sin. Of course he does. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse number 1. Deuteronomy 4, verse number 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. And what, man, what a great place we would live in if we had laws that... They didn't diminish from God's word. They didn't take anything away. And they didn't add to it. <laughs> right? We have so many laws today. Like you commit, I forget what the stats are, but basically like you commit crimes like every day. Like if you go out, especially if you, if you drive your car, like there are, there are things that you commit without even realizing it just because of the volume of laws that are on the books. There's things that you do that you don't even realize are against the law. Now they may not be enforced, Right? But, like, everybody is breaking the law, like, like, every day. Just because there's so many laws on the books. 
God said, don't add to it. Okay, don't take anything away, but don't add to it. It says that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Verse number three, your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Now look, and I want to make one more point before I get to my final point. People always say, oh, well, that was God's law for Israel. That was for Israel. That was for Israel. That was for Israel. Israel was God's model nation, was it not? Israel was the nation that God chose to deliver his words unto that they were supposed to be holy and separate from the rest of the world. And God saying, you know what? You're going to build a tabernacle. My name's going to be there. This will be the shining light to the rest of the world. Why should we not follow what God has commanded to Israel? Oh, well, that's just Israel. And they just want to blow off like all of the Old Testament law and just say, well, that was all given to the Israelites. That was for the Jews and that was for them at that time. Well, wait a minute. Why? Why would, why would his laws only be an application to someone born of the seed of Abraham for just a specific time period? If God says this is, you know, do all of these things and you'll be doing what's right and just, why wouldn't we think the same thing even today? That if we can do these things that God will bless us and that God will call us just. It doesn't make sense to just blow it off as being, well, that's just for Israel. But see, a lot of Christians want to do that because they don't like some of the verses. They don't know how to answer, well, what happens when, a ch when, when someone curses their father or mother? They don't want to say that they're put to death because their sense of justice is screwed up. Because they don't stand firm on God's word. And they don't, they, you know, they don't know what to say. You know what? I know what to say. God's word is true. God's word is right. He knows what's just and he knows what's right. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? He's saying, you're the example. And the other nations are going to see it. And they're going to know it. They're going to see, wow, there's a nation that actually has righteous judgments, a righteous law. And that is the example we need to set forth. And people will say, say, oh man, if you did that today, you'd be crazy and everyone would hate you. But people would understand that that's the right law. You know, we're ridiculed around the world and mocked, by and large, for the stance that, the, the, that America's had on homosexuality, for example. Because most of the world understands and knows that it's weird, it's perverted, it's wicked, and you just need to stamp it out like a cancer. Whether or not they even believe the Bible, People just know that. But oh, we're so enlightened that over here in the, Western, in the Western world. God's word has what we need. God, God is the judge. You know, again, I'm not the judge. I'm not the executioner. I'm not the, the legislator. I don't carry out the sentences in my own hands. But I believe that we ought to have solid doctrine. I ought to believe if you want to know what's right and wrong, we should go to the Bible. If you want to know who we should have as rulers, a ruler should be somebody that's reading in God's word and gets his sense of justice from the Bible, not out of his own heart, not coming up with his own reasoning, that we need to be looking at people. Now look, personally, I don't vote, 
But if you vote, then use these principles and say, hey, if I want someone to rule over me, do I want someone just making up whatever they want out of their own heart, or do I want somebody who says that, you know, who, who is believing in God's word and who reads it and says that this is justice and this is right? That's where you should be forming your opinion. The only reason I don't vote is because there's nobody like that out there. They don't exist. And if they do, I've never heard of them. But let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for providing us wisdom, dear God, providing us this understanding of what's right and what's just. Lord, I pray that you would please help us not to be brainwashed by the devil, by, by the world, by the media, dear Lord, by people, by wicked people, by a wicked minority who want us to accept abominations as being normal and okay and to tolerate them and accept them. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to stem that tide and to fight against the wickedness, dear Lord, that we might have righteous laws in this country, laws that follow what the scripture says, what you say is just, dear Lord, and that we can rely on your word to be true and holy and just and not on some other words or the words of man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.